Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here. Welcome back. First CHP episode of 2021. I'm going to try and finish up this little general survey of the history of the Thai Chinese. It's been a few episodes and I haven't begged you in a while, but if you'd like to subscribe to my Patreon and keep this long-running family program going another couple weeks, patreon.com slash China History Podcast. That's patreon.com slash China History Podcast. Slash, not backslash. Thanks for that, Lou. We left off last time with the government of Thailand, after the name change from Siam in 1939, with the pedal to the metal, with the promotion of Thai nationalism. And if the ethnic Chinese minority didn't exhibit enough enthusiasm for the whole idea, well, they were considered unpatriotic and all the baggage that uh, went with that accusation. Sounds familiar in our day. And during the 1930s, as we saw last episode in Part 6, the leadership inside the Thai government, led by Plek Phibun Songkram, and well, I didn't mention him last time, but Praya Pahun was no less a player in 1930s, 40s politics than Phibun, and was totally in on the whole lineup on Japan's side idea. They and their... People's Party, they knew how to play to the home crowd, and many of Thailand's ethnic Chinese had to go through some hard times. And leaders in the Chinese community who spoke out against Japan or did community organizing to resist the Japanese and their efforts to subjugate China, well, they were silenced using all the well-worn ways of intimidation, including, as I mentioned last episode, assassination, an extreme form of coercion if there ever was one. And the government ended up being quite effective in tamping down on Chinese efforts to carry out anti-Japanese demonstrations of civil disobedience on the streets of Bangkok and elsewhere during these early years of this shotgun marriage between the Empire of Japan and the Kingdom of Thailand. Now, when I say Chinese efforts against the Japanese, let me also mention not all Thai Chinese lined up on the same side of the resistance. They were never one single monolithic community who all subscribed to the same politics and had the same outlook on the affairs going down. There was a sizable number of people who said, why resist Japan? They were the ones who were standing up to the European colonialists and sending them packing. They were the good guys. Those in the Thai Chinese community who also felt this way joined hands with members of the new Thai bureaucratic elite who even with their Chinese family background, completely identified as Thai and fully embraced Phibun's vision of Thai nationalism. And then there were those who said, Japan's killing Chinese and trying to colonize parts of China and Asia. And besides all that, why do they deserve our support? Why should we look the other way at what's being done? To exacerbate the already precarious situation, Phibun's government had carried out a series of nationalizations of industries that had, up to that point, been left in the hands of Chinese merchants and industrialists. If there was a lucrative and high-volume industry and it was presently controlled by Chinese, the government took over. First was liquor in 1936, then in 1939, rice trading and milling was nationalized. Even Individual ethnic Chinese street vendors were not safe and ended up getting chased out of business and replaced by local ties. It went that deep. With all this harassment of the ethnic Chinese ties, enough signals had been sent to Japan by the Thai government to ensure them they could be counted on as their friends and that when it came to their Chinese residents, they knew how to handle them. But don't forget, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, They also hit the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, Malaya, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And part of the plan also involved Thailand. After putting up some token resistance to the invading Japanese, Phibun and his government rolled out the red carpet. A treaty of alliance was eventually signed, which, among other things, involved joint military cooperation between Thai and Japanese forces, in fighting the British and Chinese forces next door in Burma. In January 1942, Phibun declared war on Britain and the United States. As far as the uh, position taken by the USG, the way they viewed Thailand, 
in the hands of the Japanese, the country was just another Manchukuo. And Fibun, Praia Pahun, and everyone who lined up with them were simply puppets of the Japanese. Back then, in the heady opening months of World War II, it was quite easy to believe the notion of Japan's invincibility. And Fibun was looking for some hefty dividends for throwing his country's lot in with Team Japan. He fully embraced the whole idea of Japan's greater Asian co-prosperity sphere. And his expectations were quite high as far as, you know, what he wanted out of the whole thing for his country. One thing he definitely still had his eye on was the recovery of the states that had been snatched away by the British down in Malaya and the French in Indochina. Those Thai Chinese who could, despite the prohibition and consequences, put up as much resistance as possible, but in the end... With the Japanese and Thai military boots on their necks, there was little they can do. And many community leaders had to ask their constituents to hold their noses and adapt to the new realities, at least for now. And over in China, Fibun reached out to Wang Jingwei's collaborationist government. This was a rival faction to the KMT that was led by Jiang Kai-shek. And Fibun sent strong appeals to Jiang to give it all up and just join hands with the Japanese and Wang Jingwei, and that despite what he thought of them, Japan was good for China and good for Asia. Another controversial act from this time was the conscription of Thai Chinese laborers in the building of the Thai Burma Railway, the Death Railway, one of the most horrible chapters from the big, thick book of World War II and humanity. This was the railway... It was made famous in the West by uh, the 1957 David Lean film, The Bridge on the River Kwai. It was meant to be a supply route to aid the Japanese in their Burma campaign. It comprised part of the route linking Bangkok and Rangoon. Anywhere from 180,000 to a quarter million Allied prisoners of war built this stretch of railway between Banpong in Thailand and San Chuziomyut in southern Burma. If you remember the Russian roulette scene from Deer Hunter with De Niro and Christopher Walken, that was also filmed in this general location. The Japanese leaned hard on the Thai government to press gang as many Chinese laborers as possible to get this done. Not local Thai workers. They had to be Chinese Thai. The Japanese gave Fibun a quota and demanded, quite belligerently, to get it filled or else. And the government gave this thankless task to the Chinese Chamber of Commerce and told them to go rustle up the necessary numbers. How many Chinese died along with the Allied prisoners? Eh, all we could do was guess. This railway ran through what was then some of the most inhospitable parts of Thailand. It was a feat of pure engineering genius. But the suffering that was endured and the loss of life made this death railway one of the darker chapters of World War II history, not to mention in Thai Chinese history. In the beginning, Fibun really went out of his way to be a good friend to the Japanese. He wanted something in return, and he thought by suppressing Chinese anti-Japanese sentiment and cozying up to the probable winners in this conflict, he'd be able to expand Thailand's borders out a bit and get in good with Japan and reap the benefits of having bet on the right horse. And when Fibun started to get a little too overconfident about the esteem the Japanese authorities held him in, and began to act on his own, making moves in those lost territories prematurely, well, he was rebuffed by his Japanese bosses, and they told him to stand down. This, and other things going on, allowed Fibun, in time, to realize his big plans to ride Japan's coattails to the big time. It wasn't going to happen. And Japan's overbearing behavior in Thailand, the obscene profits they were making in the economy, the unabashed one-sidedness of the relationship, and everything they demanded cooperation on, the, the disrespect they heaped on the local Thai nationals, interfering in Thai domestic and political affairs, all of these factors combined finally got to Fibun. And before long... His love affair began to hit the skids. Mid-1943, well, Japan wasn't finished, but things were looking a far cry from 1941. 
and Feeboon began to realize the payoff he was looking for wasn't looking promising, and he began to push back in some ways, foot dragging, not taking certain demands seriously, and the ones running the show in Bangkok on behalf of Japan, well, they picked up on this sooner or later and in no uncertain terms, let Feeboon know they didn't take kindly to this kind of thing, and after many threats were implied, well, the two sides made nice, and Japan even handed Feeboon the Malay states he wanted back for so long. By end 1943, well, there was definitely blood in the water, and the Allied powers knew this, and so did Feeboon. Handing over the five Malay states was, well, by this time, an empty gesture, because Japan was giving away something that probably wasn't going to be theirs much longer. And Feeboon finally came to the conclusion that, if there was ever a time to start furiously backpedaling and distancing himself from the Empire of Japan, now was it. The time had come to start planning for the future, and this meant reaching out to Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist government in China. He even tried to contact the communists, but they wouldn't have anything to do with him. And out of nowhere, in August 1944, Feeboon fell from grace. The Thai National Assembly pulled the curtain down on Feeboon, and just like that, he was out, removed as prime minister and as the commander-in-chief of the army. And later on, Plek Feeboon Songkram will be tried as a war criminal for collaborating with the enemy, but he gets off the hook and doesn't stay on the sidelines for too long. And makes a comeback in 1947. We'll get to that. And by 1944, and certainly into 1945, the Japanese presence in Thailand was shaken quite badly. And all the local ethnic Chinese resistance groups, large and small, made life miserable for the Japanese. And not only were they tripped up at every opportunity, all those who were perceived as collaborators got hit too. There was a brutal payback period that saw a lot of retribution meted out to members of the Thai Chinese community. The Chinese Chamber of Commerce, the one organization tasked with being the interlocutor between the Chinese community and the Japanese and Feeboon's government, they too fell under a high degree of criticism for the way they were perceived as collaborators, even though they, like so many others, just tried to save their own skins in the face of Japanese threats. Well, we all know what happened. Japan lost the war. Then there was the Chinese Civil War that concluded in October 1949 with the founding of the People's Republic. The British had returned to their former colonies, and the Malay states that weren't Japan's to give had to be handed over to Britain. The French went right back to ruling Indochina. And over in Thailand, it was a new day. For one, formal diplomatic relations were established with China, still the Republic of China at this time. Feeboon was a bona fide war criminal, according to both the Court of Public Opinion and the victorious allies. Feeboon had no trouble meeting that threshold. And when they were going around extracting pounds of flesh from the losers and from Japan's helpers during the war, Feeboon was in their crosshairs. The Thai government had a whole hell of a lot of mansplaining to do for the choices they made. In the end, the post-war Thai government... They had to hand over a few gimmies to the Allies. To the Brits, they wanted some of that Thai rice down in Malaya. Even the Russians demanded the Thai government stop clamping down so hard on the communists who were doing their mischief on the streets of Bangkok. And in 1946, Thailand went back to being Siam again, officially. And the new prime minister, former U.S. ambassador Seni Pramoch, who refused to line up behind Feeboon about the whole declaring war in the United States thing, well, he ended up serving as prime minister three times, never for long. He couldn't have been more cooperative with the Allies, and especially to the Americans. And he did his best to distance himself from the Feeboon wartime administration. As for the Thai Chinese, with Feeboon out of the way and with Japan defeated... They had a heck of a comeback in Siam and elsewhere. Chinese newspapers were back on the newsstands again, and Chinese-language schools back in business. As stakeholders in this victory over Japan, China gained no small amount of prestige. But with civil war breaking out following all that had happened since 1937, 
It led to yet another eruption of emigration, with 86,000 Chinese making their way to Siam in just 1946 alone. That set off alarm bells in the kingdom. The following year, well, they didn't pass an exclusion act or anything, but a quota was put on the number of Chinese allowed to immigrate to Siam. It was initially set at 10,000 per year, and the resurgence of Chinese nationalism exhibited on the streets was really freaking out a lot of people. Then in March 1948, some Chinese schools refused to fly the Siamese flag, and a lot of political hay was made of that, and the schools were all closed down. And then a month later, a bunch of Feebun's military buddies overthrew the government in a coup, and this cleared the way for the return of Plek Feebun Songkram. Pushing back on Siam's Chinese was practically Feebun's middle name. A lot of Chinese nationalistic activities were suppressed, and once again, after a brief moment of rejuvenation, Siam's Chinese had to lay low. And for good measure, Feebun had the quota of Chinese immigrants to Siam cut from 10,000 to a couple hundred. And once again, Siam was renamed Thailand, and nationalism Feebun style was all the rage. He stands out in modern Thai history as truly the face of anti-Chinese sentiment in that great kingdom. And then in October 1949, the communists emerged victorious on the Chinese mainland and all across Nanyang. From the Philippines to Burma and all points in between, overseas Chinese who had assets in China, property, factories, and businesses on the mainland, they lost everything. The gateways to China were all slammed shut to those who, who in the past, came and went as they pleased. So right away, you can imagine the crimp this put on immigration to Siam and everywhere else. And the Siamese government didn't skip a beat in condemning suspected Chinese sympathizers, deporting some. There was, there was a paranoia that set in, and talk of the so-called uh, Quinta Columna, or Fifth Column, that saw Mao Zedong clandestinely directing and organizing his Chinese minions on the streets of Bangkok and elsewhere in the country to overthrow the established order and drag the nation down the communist road. And not just in Siam. This dreaded notion of a fifth column had roots that were spreading all across the countries of Nanyang. Some Thai Chinese, with their patriotism burning hot and with their ungovernable optimism in the new China, went back and became part of the 1950s China dream. And later on, eh, probably got plowed under by one of Mao's famous campaigns. Policies that penalized Chinese for not assimilating fast enough were put in place and enforced. Chinese names had to be replaced with Thai names. And determined to hit the Chinese where it hurt most, new regulations were put in place that upset the established business norms. Between the nationalizing of industries and favoring local ties over Chinese, the government made a mess of things. Now, it wasn't as bad as Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, but it got bad enough whereby the Chinese of Bangkok were cordially invited back to uh, mop up and set things straight again. And both the PRC and ROC leaders wagged their fingers at Feebun about these anti-Chinese measures he was pushing through. But as one door shut, another door opened, and the Chinese rushed in. This was in the world of international finance, banking, insurance, and other financial services. Well, this is nothing new, but the scale and the sophistication was something the East India companies of the past probably wouldn't have recognized. Many of the biggest banks today opened at this time, including Bangkok Bank. Today, over three trillion baht in assets. And as far as how Uncle Sam viewed this state of affairs, well, Feebun may have been a Japanese collaborator, but now he was our collaborator. And the Truman and Eisenhower administrations got on famously with him. There were educational and cultural exchanges and good old-fashioned military aid and arms sales to boot. Thailand even backed us in the Korean War, supplying the U.S. side with some of that famous rice of theirs. And not to skip ahead so quickly, but at the historic 1955 Bandung Conference, one of Zhou Enlai's magic moments on the world stage, well, one of the things he said was, 
If a Chinese was born or resides permanently overseas, I'm paraphrasing, they are nationals of that country, and the PRC dropped their official policy that maintained anyone of Chinese descent were PRC nationals. The fear of the secret Chinese communist fifth column (laughs) never really went away. Not in Thailand, nor elsewhere in Southeast Asia. All across Southeast Asia, many segments of society were living large in this post-war boom years of the 1950s. The U.S. government was generous with the Cold War dividends, you know, as long as you did what they asked. And despite cuddling with Uncle Sam and being our guy in Bangkok and all, Feebun's government still kept a back channel open with the PRC. Of course, we did the same thing. Those familiar with Thai politics over the past few decades will not be surprised to know that after a few failed attempts to get rid of them, finally, in 1957, Feebun was overthrown. He ended up skedaddling to Japan, where he was granted asylum and died there seven years later in 1964. Same year Hard Day's Night came out. And after booting him out and replacing Plek Feebun Songkram with Sarit Tanorat, another military strongman, it had been a rough 1950s for Thai politics. And eh, money does that. And there was a lot of it sloshing around. Sarit Tanorat? kept up Feebun's anti-communist stance and stuck close to Captain America and was one of our point men in the Cold War. This was the time of McCarthyism, Red China, and the Soviets. Things were at a major froth. And for the Thai Chinese, who had done so much for the economy, going back to the Sukhothai and Ayutthaya Kingdom days, they once again rose to the occasion, and thanks to an entrepreneurial spirit that never disappointed, coupled with the loss of the Chinese market as a destination to invest their formidable troves of capital, a lot of this money stayed at home. And Feebun's past policies of nationalization and putting stumbling blocks in the way of Thai Chinese companies, well, these these monopolies gave way for more efficient publicly traded and private business operations that grew into multinational operations and today are among the biggest regional conglomerates. In 1972, after Nixon paid his visit to China and broke the ice, first Malaysia in 1974, established formal relations, then the Philippines, and then in 1975, Thai Prime Minister Kukri Pramoj visited the PRC and formal diplomatic relations were established with the Corollary to that being, relations with the government on Taiwan were severed. And into the 80s, 90s, and now, in our day, the great Thai Chinese tycoons, including the most famous and renowned of them all, Tanin Chernawunan, Xie Guomin, founder of the CP Group, they are today, as they had always been going back to Taksin the Great, the locomotives who transformed their country's economy into one of the five Asian tiger cubs, along with Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam. These so-called tiger cub economies, of course, were the smaller versions of the four Asian tiger economies of Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Together, these nine economies, and the broader Southeast Asian economies, well, actually, I guess you could say going all the way back to Qing Dynasty times, comprised a so-called bamboo network, or Zhuwang, that has come to completely dominate the region's trade, investment, construction, and finance. And as we saw over the past seven episodes, this network had centuries to grow, interconnect, and become so strong and resilient, no world war or cataclysm could ever shake it. And the biggest companies and family fortunes in the kingdom of Thailand today are led by people whose ancestry, like so many across Southeast Asia, can be traced back to China. And as we kept hearing over and over, practically ad nauseum, always, they all came from two provinces, Fujian, and Guangdong, including Hainan, which since 1988 has been its own administrative entity and not part of Guangdong. Every nation whose borders touch the South China Sea, they all have their renowned and 
celebrated ethnic Chinese billionaires who did so much to contribute to the country's prosperity and political standing in the region. And in Thailand today, besides the Chirna Wunong family, there's Tiang Chiratiwat of the Central Group, Cheliu Yuvidia of Red Bull fame, Sarun Si Ratanapakti, whose business empire comprises Thai Beverage, TCC Group, and Fraser and Neve, and the late Wichai Sri Watanaprapa of the Duty Free King Power Group. Yeah, football fans will remember him as the owner of the Leicester City Football Club, who died so tragically in a helicopter crash in October 2018. These are some of the headliners, but like it is in most places, it was the combined brains, brawn, and industry of the rank-and-file ethnic Thai Chinese whose names and fortunes eh, don't even come close to these billionaire tycoons. These family patriarchs, and matriarchs too, and their progeny, quietly and without fanfare, comprised the bricks and mortar that acted as the foundation and building structure, which provided the economics that allowed Thailand to become this financial and investment powerhouse in Asia. You know, over these past seven episodes, as you've noticed, I haven't mentioned too many names and individual stories. A lot of the time I felt, eh, if I mention one, I had to mention a hundred. History is made by people, and when I introduce the Chinese people and their place in Thai history and society, well, I hope you don't mind all the generalizing I did along the way. Once you zoom in and look at some of these people, only then does a lot of what I've been trying to introduce spring to life. One of the main sources I used throughout this series was Jeffrey Singh and Pimperfy Bisalputra's A History of the Thai Chinese. I've had links to that book on my website at the accompanying pages to this podcast series. That book came out in 2015. It's loaded with many, many stories about the Thai Chinese from across all five of the main linguistic groups. The Chinese and Thai words used throughout the series, if you refer to the webpage at teacup.media, they are all meticulously prepared for you by none other than your humble narrator personally, pinyin, Chinese characters, Thai, and English. Thai Chinese history, eh, it's still in the process of being written. The people and events being inscribed into their history continue on with the tradition that goes back centuries. And from Ayutthaya Kingdom times and clear through the Chakri dynasty into our day, the ethnic Chinese of Thailand, well, sometimes they had to keep their heads down and not make waves, you know, depending on the direction of the winds fanned by local politics and sudden changes to the established order. And also, as we saw, Thailand's ethnic Chinese also had to deal with the occasional reverberations for many shockwaves emanating from China. I think I emphasized it enough times now among all the overseas Chinese who have made their homes in all these lands that border the South China Sea, the Nanyang, even going back to before the Qing dynasty, Thailand was always a special case. So many ended up there. And so many of the original inhabitants of Thailand, even before the Sukhothai Kingdom, 1238 to 1438, these original peoples were migrants from southwest China. Thai people who spoke various Thai dialects. That's Thai, T-A-I. So in the case of Thailand a beautiful place I've been to many times and hope to retire to in the not-too-distant future. As far as the Chinese are concerned, and what percent of the population do they really make up? Eh, Where does it begin and where does it end? The commercial aspect of the Thai Chinese heritage is perhaps overemphasized. The Thai Chinese dominance of commerce and industry there was so conspicuous But the Thai Chinese were more than businessmen, and no small amount of contributions were made by them in science, education, culture, politics, government, the military, and all throughout society. A society that, well, because of its Buddhist tradition, knows a thing or two about helping others. Although I didn't drill down that deep, there are those stories too, and so much other little-known history.
So I hope you didn't mind if we sort of rushed to the finish after World War II. I only meant to take this up to the start of uh, the reign of King Rama IX, His Majesty the late King Pumipon. Now, for the next episode, I was going to include this subtopic somewhere inside this series, but then I got too far ahead of myself, and then it was too late. I just wanted to give a nice little general survey of the Puranican Chinese of Phuket. But rather than that, I had the sudden inspiration to just make that a standalone future episode, maybe written after I move there, or wherever I end up in Thailand. So, next episode, we're on to something new and exciting. Already got it all planned out. Okay, I'm out of here. Don't forget to mark your calendars. Chinese New Year of the Ox, coming up on February 12th. Lincoln's birthday. Yeah, my father's too. May he rest in peace. Okay, let's try and make it a date again next time. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off for the first time in 2021 from Los Angeles, California. COVID central, baby. Boy, is it ever the time to make California great again. Take care, everyone, and do try and carve out a half hour of your time in two weeks for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.